All right, Matt. Mm hmm. I am going to. Um, you're the history guy. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm the. I don't know. I like to do engineering stuff. I like things like that. You're so good about not saying rocket scientist. <laughs> Shut up. So, <laughs> so no, my mom put me in my place one yeah, time. She did. Yeah. So I've got a quote that I have read. Yeah. Right. And um, I would like to pull the thread and just kind of chase it wherever it goes. Some time ago on this program, I commented, and it sounded a little bit like an old man complaining, and I took a little heat from people that had reached out and messaged us and were like, hey, I don't think Destin gets it. That was when I was referring to what I was seeing around me that I referred to. The word I used was weakness. Weakness. Yeah, Yeah, I knew where you were going with that. So I'm going to read a quote, and uh, I just want to see where you're at on this. Okay. It is a quote uh, most often attributed to someone named Michael Hopf, H-O-P-F. Okay. um, From a book. Uh, I got to believe this this was written before this person. There's a book called Those Who Remain. I haven't read the book, don't know anything about it. No, me neither. But I think I've heard this long before this individual said this. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Is that what you meant when you used the word weak a while back? I don't know. I don't know. So what I meant when I used the word weakness is there was an inability to think creatively, and you just kind of accepted what you were told. And I've I haven't changed my position. I have observed an inability to think creatively in situations. I, I went to a place recently, and uh, I, I don't even—I don't even want to explain the interaction because it's embarrassing for all parties involved. I asked for a certain type of. Uh, there were two ice cream cones. <laughs> all right. And I asked for a certain type of ice cream cone, and um, there was a sugar cone and a cake cone, and I'm trying to watch my weight. And so I was buying some ice cream for some some young men that had helped me work on some stuff. Um, they, they didn't really know how to use hammers and stuff like that, so I came up with this thing that I needed done for these young men that I'm, I'm working with. Um, I needed help destroying this wall. Wonderful. And so I was like, okay, I need you to knock that wall down. And they're like, really? Yes, with this hammer. You're like Ronald Reagan talking to Mikhail Gor- Gorbachev. Right? It's, just, <laughs> it's no. inspiring. And, and so I've seen how you parent. You've seen how I parent. We intentionally stretch our children. We ask them to do things that they don't know how to do. Yeah. And we expect them to figure it out. And, and they, fail some. And fail. And if they mess up, it's not them that failed. It, it's us. Or the plan was to fail. Right. It's okay. Like some video games, you're supposed to die at the beginning. Figure out the way to, to get through this obstacle. Mm-hmm. And so I still remember my dad asking me to drill a hole in a round steel shaft. And I ran home. He was fixing the lawnmower. I, I grabbed the shaft. I ran home and I set up on the drill press. And he said, Destin, look, I need a hole right here for a cotter pin. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to try to drill this thing. It ain't going to work. So go over to the belt sander, sand a flat on it. Then you can get through it with a drill bit. Do you understand? Yes, sir. All right. Run. Go do it. We're going to fix this lady's lawnmower. Yes, sir. And so it was a neighbor down the street. He was fixing her lawnmower. So I I took that rod and I ran. Probably shouldn't have ran with a big, long steel rod, but I did. I ran. Knew how to use a belt sander. He had taught me that before. Put a flat on it. Chucked up a little one eighth inch bit in the drill bit. Very excited. I was using, you know, I was I was getting it done for daddy, right? Turned on the drill, brought down the the drill bit, broke the bit. Hmm. It walked off center, broke the bit. Oh man. Well, I know where other drill bits are. Chucked another one up, broke another drill bit. Finally, I learned on the third drill bit I had to like start really, really slow and get the hole started. Mm. And then I pulled it all the way down through there. I was probably 11, 12 years old. How much did those bits cost that you broke? 
probably a buck each. How much like time that. did it take you to break them? Oh, 10 seconds. Yeah. So one minute of total breakage with bit changes and two bucks. Yeah. And you've got it for life. Yeah. Sounds like a good investment to me. So I ran back down the street to the neighbor. Dad was fixing a lawnmower. I said, Dad, I'm so sorry because I, I knew that drill bits were important to Dad. And I never put them back. It's just kids never put drill bits back. And uh, I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I I broke two drill bits. It was my confession, you know. It's okay, boy. Uh, That's why I told you to sand the flat on it. Otherwise, you'd have broke 10. Hmm. I said, I knew you'd break them, but thanks for drilling the hole. I said, yes, sir. I remembered that. Hmm. Because to me, it was a failure. To him, it was a positive. Mm -hmm. He was teaching me how to drill a hole in the shaft. But what he was really teaching me in that moment was how to parent. And I didn't know that because I didn't know the Lord would bless me with children. So that happened. So fast forward to now. Recently, I'll give you an an example, the ice cream cone thing. I wanted a certain ice cream cone. I said, can I have one of those small ice cream cones? I don't know what to call that, but can I have that one? How do I order that? And the individual behind the counter looked at me and said, I don't know. And behind this individual, there were 10 people working. And I just looked at them and I I said, okay, that's the one I'd want. How how do we do that? And they said, "I, I don't know. Nothing else. Silence. I don't know. And I thought, whoa, this is what? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. And I said, uh, well, where is ice cream on the menu? And they said, I, it's up there somewhere. You know, and I turned around and I, and I pointed. I said, well, let's look. And so I went into teacher mode. I said, well, let's look at the menu. And I thought, well, maybe this is a person that brand new, you know, doesn't know. First job, whatever. Let's look at the menu. Huh, let's look up here. Okay. All right. Well, there's ice cream. It says dish. Okay, there's a, what is that? There's a sugar cone. Oh, it says it's a cake cone. That's what it is. I'm sorry. I should have ordered a cake cone. Can I have a cake cone, please? And they said, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to ring that up. Hmm. And I said, and I, and I looked and there was, there were, the individual did not want to solve the problem. And they, I did, what did they want you to order something else? I didn't know. I, it was, I didn't know what to do. And so I, I said, well, is there someone we could ask? Is there someone here that knows how to ring that up? And they looked at me like, don't make me ask. And I was like, oh man, you know, and I felt pity and, and I felt sad. And I was like, is this individual oppressed? What, what's happening? Like, do I need to help this person? Blink twice. <laughs> if Yeah. Blink twice. If you're in danger, you know? And so I didn't know what to do. So we, we worked through that. I turned to my son and I said, what was that? He said, I don't know. That was strange. We went to uh, GameStop later. It was my daughter and, and myself. And uh, my son has started playing Legend of Zelda, the the gold cartridge, right? Oh. It's awesome. We sit around and we play together. It's the most video game magic I ever felt. Same. Yeah. And so we've been playing together and he's, tr- he's troubleshooting and problem solving and I'm encouraging this. And, and I've... He's getting into these, you know, types of role playing games. And I've heard, I didn't play it as a child, but I heard that Final Fantasy, like the old school Final Fantasy games were really good at that. Yeah. And so have you ever played those? Oh, yeah. Are they good at that? Final Fantasy 1 is still one of my favorite games ever. I really liked 3 as well. I played the later stuff on more sophisticated consoles. Which one should I get him? 1. 1? Okay. So I went to GameStop and I said, do you have any of the old Final Fantasy games? I'd like to buy one for my son. And he goes, ah, oh, let me look. And he goes to the computer. No, we don't have any in store. I was like, well, you know, and I thought to myself, I was like, well, I can clearly go home and just Google it and get one off eBay. I was like, no, they're in my community. I, w- I want to support this store. Mm-hmm. Can I order one from you? Like, and you just send it here. I'll, I'll pay full price right now. And you just send it here and, I, and I'll get it. And yeah, can we do that? He's like, oh yeah, totally. I was like, great. And huh. so he takes a minute, he starts pecking away at the keyboard, and he's like, okay, cool, yeah, well, let's do it. Um, what's your name? And I was like, oh, oh, no, it's the thing. They want all my information. I was like, I just want the thing, and I want to give him money. I was like, Josiah Penny Wessel. That's the name I order things on. So mm-hmm. I, I do it in a way that's not lying. I was like, that, that's that's how I order things, Josiah Penny Wessel. And they're like, oh, okay, um, let's see. Um, yeah, what's your phone number? I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not do that. And... The guy looks at me and goes, I have to put a phone number in. Uh, I was like, great. 999 555 I said, well, the area code here is 256. I said, 256 
two five six one, you know, or whatever. Two five six two five six two five six one. He's like, yeah, that's I can't do that. And I was like, it's cool, man. Whatever you got to put in there. I, I just want to order the game. I just want to buy it from you. He's like, yeah, I don't know how to do that. Just yeah, act he, like you're a walrus with flippers. <laughs> Move the flippers over to the number pad. And just and then bang your flippers repeatedly <laughs> so, until all of the spaces yeah, are populated. I just want to give you money. And so um, what I realized is every business has a mission or every like every organization has a mission that they're trying to accomplish. And I believe that people are losing sight of whatever that mission is. If I'm selling you ice cream, my mission is to put ice cream in your hands and take your money. That is why I'm here and that's what I'm doing. Yes. If I'm at GameStop, my mission is to put a game in your hands and take your money. But I'm noticing that the mission is becoming more about, well, I have to do all this stuff. I've got, I've got to like acquire this information. I have to do this. It's difficult for people to think outside of the box and be like, you know what? We've got this thing we got to do. I just need to whatever in order to just make it happen. Ultimately, I'm just going to give this guy a game. Right. But maybe that is the mission. Like maybe the biz, the business model of GameStop has changed and where they actually make their money is selling that phone number. And maybe they get penalized if phone numbers come up bogus. Maybe. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that kid would know that. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Mission clarity is is what you need for a thing to work. Mission drift is what happens when it's not working. So for example, you and I had this idea one time that since we're so very, very, very different, we should have a podcast. And the mission would be that we talk about things that we care about as friends anyway and share it with other people. And if even a very small percentage of those people are edified, are edified to the point that they're like, I would want to kick in on that. Or uh, I could buy earbuds from someone else, but I'm going to get the ones that help make this thing go. Then even if it's a very small percentage, well, that would work. And then somehow we could support our families by being friends and thinking about things with intentional scheduled time together. They, that's the strategy, right? But to be clear, the mission of this podcast is what? To not have dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> We're stopping those once and for all. People people thought that was some like statement of affirmation about yeah. like, hey, you can ask anything here. It's yeah. not. It's no. a warning. Yeah. Don't bring that crap in here. <laughs> we don't do dumb questions around these parts. Jack wagons. Uh, no, I, I think I think honestly the, the mission is to promote authentic deep friendships. Um I'm just making this up. We've never talked about this. To to promote authentic deep friendships, also to um demonstrate as we figure out how to give and take with people you disagree with. Uh, you, yes. You and I disagree quite often. Yeah. I, I feel like that showed up more early on. I, I think increasingly as we've gone along, it's gone from, huh, we really are pretty different. We come at a lot of these things really differently to, to more gradually just, nah, I understand why you're coming at it the way you do Destin. Okay. I get it. That's informed my thinking. I see that some. I see my thinking informing your thinking on other points as well. And increasingly, I feel like our conversations are as much as anything about like, what does it look like when I know I can't wreck a friendship with one conversation? I'm safe. I can't wreck you. I can't, I can't break you. I can't ruin your brain. I can't destroy your life. You're stable. and Our friendship is stable. What does it look like when you have the luxury of a friendship like that? To just think candidly about the stuff that comes up in life and the things that are on your mind. So increasingly, I feel like we got two separate processors that are gathering data day in and day out all the time. And then from time to time, we come together and we let our processors work the same problem together. And I find it really satisfying to see what happens when, when I have a, an external processor that I think is dynamic and excellent to point at whatever problem or topic we're dealing with. So I think, I think the mission of the show has not drifted, but I do think it's evolved. I'm not afraid of offending you. How dare you? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I know that there are things that you and I way disagree on. 
way, way, way disagree on. Some of those things we talk about on mic, some of those things we don't. And you provide grace to me in the areas where you disagree with what I do and how I, I conduct my business. I provide grace to you in the areas because we know that ultimately we're pulling in the same direction. We're unified in purpose. I trust your process and the goodwill of what you're trying to accomplish with your life. Even when I disagree with the strategies you're employing, I don't disagree with them morally. I just, I mean, my biggest points of disagreement with you are strategic. Yes. And, and all that to be said, let's come back to this quote, okay. because I think herein lies the issue. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Change that to whatever gender you want that to be. If you're talking about weak people, however you want to say that. Mm -hmm. I think right now, as I read history, I don't read as much history as you, but I know that there's a cyclical nature to societies. I can see that, mm -hmm. right? The British Empire, right? I mean, the... They break the same way. They do. And and so when the times get very, very good, people get weak and we start to manufacture things to disagree about and mm -hmm. argue about. And we, we lose the ability to have grace and interact with each other in a really good way. We forget how to disagree and we're like, well, you know, maybe we should just quit being unified and maybe we should just fight. Uh, yep. And so, and then it happens and then some, there's a rift that, that occurs. And then there's this big rip in the fabric of unity and society. And you think it'd be better if you weren't together anymore. And then it turns out you were dead wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Matt, in this cycle, mm -hmm. hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. That one. Where? It's the last one. Weak men create hard times? Yes. That's where we are. Yes. Yeah, unequivocally, don't care who I offend. Yes, unequivocally, as a student of history who studies the history of thought, the evolution of society, look, I don't very often do the appeal to expertise, but this is what I do for a living. That's where we are. So it was just, it's that simple. I'm telling you with maximum conviction, 10 out of 10, that's where we are. This is what has happened to the great empires and the great civilizations. There's so many factors. It's very fashionable and tempting even for me to jump on a mic and be like, and the things that ruined it are all the things I don't like. Some of the things I don't like are what ruined it. Some of the, is that thunder? That is thunder. Oh, I hope people can hear that. That's awesome. <laughs> like that lends a lot of credence to whatever it is I'm saying right now. I, well, that's all, I just feel it like in yeah, store yeah. or something. <laughs> a lot of theories about why Rome broke. And, and maybe it'd be fun to do a whole episode on Edward Gibbon. He was the big theorist in the 19th century who speculated as to why Rome broke and what people have done in 140 years of dialogue with Gibbons. But weakness certainly factors in. And what I mean by weakness is not, I mean, a lack of fortitude a lack of connectedness with the actual problems of humanity and what you're trying to fix and an outsourcing so much outsourcing that human helplessness takes over. Remember when it was cute, like 25 years ago when somebody was like, Hey, nobody knows how to make a mouse. And we were all like, Oh, that's wild. Huh? No, that's actually a problem. When people see problems in chaos, they solve it. Somebody rises to the top and it's like, everybody listen up. Rally to me. Kids stand here. Women and older men stand right there. If you can lift more than 70 pounds over your head, you got to come with me right now. We're doing this now. And everybody goes. Nobody's worrying about lawsuits. Nobody's worrying about whether this is best practice or how people will feel. You solve that problem. Eventually, in the interest of going into protection mode, institution mode, societies get to a place where that capacity for action, think about thing, identify problem, solve problem, that ceases to be the defining thought process of a generation, of a people. 
And then what happens is not that you get pitiable, weak people. I don't think that's what you're saying. What happens is you just have cultural paralysis. And the only thing you can really muster is outrage at other people who you imagine are 100% responsible for why you feel the malaise of cultural paralysis. Why everything feels like this impotent whining at everybody else and begging authority figures or experts to come and solve your problems. Because even if you could solve the problems, you're red taped out of even doing it. You can't do that. People start punching people in a parking lot. Nobody helps them anymore. Somebody shooting somebody, everybody gets out their phone and not even calls for help. They just point the phone at the people who are shooting people. That to me is where I see the weakness on display. See the problem. To be clear, not everybody does that. Solve the problem. Not everybody. I'm speaking in hyperbole. Yep. But in broad cultural strokes, we're seeing this everywhere. Why does a TikTok video exist of a guy on a crowded subway grabbing an Asian lady by the hair and putting her in a headlock and walking her around and ranting insanely while clearly on substances and everybody looks at their shoes except the couple of people who turn on their phones? Did that happen? Yes. Yes. More, why? Why? Just think about the reality that that video exists. It shouldn't exist because the 80 people in the subway car should have beaten the living daylights out of a man who was abusing a woman in front of their face. But because of who everybody was in the equation, because of where that situation happened on the map, because of Twitter and because of impotence and because of a general societal inability to say, there's a problem. I need to do something. I am the solution. I am the solution. That video exists and it should never exist because nobody should have taken the time to even think to get out of camera. Somebody should have done something to protect that woman and they didn't. And it's happening all over the place. And that to me is your canary in the coal mine. Yeah, I think we're in phase four. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by Raycon. Raycon makes earbuds that we like a whole bunch of different kinds. They even got some new ones. They got uh, gamer earbuds that we were seeing. They got cool colors and a whole different shape to them. We've been using these things forever. We love the Bluetooth functionality. We love the sound profile. We love the fact that they hold a charge until the end of time. <laughs> the end like of time. 50 until the out of the single death of the universe. That's exactly <laughs> it. You're fine. <laughs> and even... And they might even charge off of the heat death of the universe. I don't know. They, they work really, really well. I'm not sure the heat death of the universe will destroy my Raycons. They've been <laughs> if, tough. If you'd like to support the sponsor, which supports the podcast, this is how you can do that. Go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to tell you what I see on the page. So when I go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ, that pulls up a page with a banner up at the top. It says save 15% with promo code today, Agnow. And, uh, I'm going to go up top to the the little nav bar. There's all kinds of stuff you can... Man, they have more than just earbuds now. You can get... Oh, wow. They have new things. Stop, Destin. We're just supposed to get people to buy the earbuds. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to click on earbuds. There's other things there, too, that you can have look you at. Have you lost your mind? If you want to look at it. So there's four types of earbuds you can choose from. The everyday earbuds, the fitness earbuds, the gaming earbuds, or the work earbuds. So, um, yeah, you can check those up out. The gaming earbuds are new. Go to check those out. If you go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ and use the promo code NDQ, and then you will also unlock an additional 15% off. Thank you so much for supporting the sponsors that supports the podcast. And we are grateful. So how do we fast forward through the bad times? <laughs> how do we get to the strong place again? Well, the answer is on the front end of your list of four things. What you're talking about right now is the Strauss-Howe generational theory. The what? Strauss-Howe oh, really? generational okay, theory. That's I'm, I'm who Googling. I think made it popular. Strauss-H-O-W-E? Yeah. They wrote a book called Generations. Oh, wow. I, I think it's two guys, I think. Oh, there's I, I a whole know. Wikipedia article on this. Uh, it's a it's one of the ways that people interpret the unfolding of history, and it's become a rather popular one, and not on one side of the aisle or another. People from all over the political spectrum agree that this has merit. Other people from all over the political spectrum think that, that it's oversimplified hogwash. For those who think it has merit, they would point to repetitions in all kinds of marginally to very free societies and say, look, this is what happens. They would point to, what was it, John Adams, what he was saying about, like, my generation must become masters of war so that my son's generation 
can learn to farm and manufacture so that my grandson's generation can make art and music, something like that. Really? Like you got to earn those things societally. Maybe it was John Adams or somebody in that range. Oh, hold on. It says defining it. I'm just looking at the contents page on the Wikipedia page. It says defining a generation says the cycle. Okay. They call it a cycle. Uh, let's see. The first turning, they call these turnings, one, two, three, four. There's turnings. The first one is the high. The, the book that's famous is called The Fourth Turning. came out in the late 90s, like, like about the same time as The Matrix. So it says the high, the awakening, the unraveling, and crisis. Mm-hmm. Is this a book I read? Where, how do I, how do I yeah, read more you about just, this? You can just grab the book. There's a book. Okay, what would you say it's I called? I read that Al Gore gave it to every member of Congress when he was vice president. Really? Mm-hmm. What's it called? The Fourth Turning, I believe. Yeah. Okay, let me look this up. The Fourth Turning. An American Prophecy. What the cycles of history tell us about America's next rendezvous with destiny. Holy cow, that's a title. Well, think about this. It came out about the same time as The Matrix. And think about the premise of The Matrix that was laughable back then. Take I saw, the red pill. I saw or a tweet about pill. this lately. The idea was that the machines set The Matrix in 1999 because it was the high point of human civilization. And we were all like, no, it wasn't. But then I'm kind of doing the math on the last then social 20, media. <laughs> like, yeah, if I could pick a time that I would freeze humanity until we figure out our crap, I would go right back to just before what we do for a living. I'd go right back to just before we crammed everybody in the room in one giant party and thought there would be no consequences. But we still had just enough connectedness to travel Maybe get on the phone together. Maybe everybody can make art. Uh, early 2000s? To me, that seems like The Matrix was pretty close. That was about the golden age. There's an audiobook option for this. Well, I'm, I'm how gonna... about that? Man. Are you familiar with Audible? I've, I've heard of it. They okay. sponsor the program. They, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you know that if you... Text NDQ to 500, 500. You Are they a, sponsoring this episode? No, probably not, but you do get a 30-day free trial. And then you can go and you can grab that and you get access to the whole Audible Plus That's catalog. amazing. I just know that. Yeah. Dude. Okay. All right. So, obviously, I'm going to read this. All right. So, my point is, well, heck, you know a lot more about this than I do. Have you read that book? No, I have not. Okay. Nope. Just that. familiar with the, the argument. Okay. So, this is what I want to do. I want to figure out how to fast forward. Yes. Past the uh the bad times yes or hard times they call it all right so i'm going to read it one more time hard times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men and weak men create hard times there's this uh i don't know it's, it's a complementary theory or explanation of how things work in the old testament where you can see the children of israel they yes <laughs> they the judges ag- cycle yeah mm mm-hmm. mhm you know, and then they kind of saddle up next to God and they start doing what's right. And then at some point, you know, people start doing what is right in their own eyes. That statement in Judges, mm-hmm. and in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That right there, that alone, you can see it. You can see what's happening right now is everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, even the far right that um, imag- the claims to like God. Yeah. 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 No, what, what, yeah, there's enough problems to go around for everybody. Yeah. Like everybody looks bad here. Yeah, exactly. What's actually happening is like, oh, well, I want to take control of everything and I want everybody to think exactly what I think. I want what is yes. right in my eyes yes. to, to be the, the way that. Yeah. And, okay, two <sighs> things. People, we so, are dumb. So, how, we as people how are dumb. does society happen when that is how we understand right, wrong, how things ought to be, how to treat each other? What makes morality in that situation? Because there's no agreement. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Ethical relativism. But that doesn't translate. That, that, that's your own opinion, sure. But how do you make policy out of ethical relativism? Uh, Force. You create the illusion of consensus. So you get morality by consensus. 52% of people think this is right. Therefore, it's right now. Or you, you just exploit the mechanisms of power to make your thing win and you do whatever it takes to make sure the thing that you are sure is right in your own eyes wins. And it doesn't matter how you run, who you run over. It doesn't matter what happens to truth. 
I saw a uh, a clip the other day where there were protesters, and doesn't matter what they were protesting, but they were in the street, and they were all kneeling, blocking four lanes of traffic, hmm. and they had their sign talking about the thing that they wanted you to. They didn't care about the people in cars. They cared about lawmakers or somebody like that thinking exactly what they thought. And then that Italian guy grabbed one and threw him all the way over the side of the road. Did that happen? <laughs> and one, I, I saw a video like that. No, I didn't guy see this gets one. out and he just grabs this hundred pound college kid and just <laughs> <laughs> throws no. him in his sign. I didn't the see road that. And drives away. That's a strong man I taking care very, of a weak person. He looked like one of those high waisted, mustachioed circus guys with the circular dumbbells. <laughs> <laughs> he looked just like that guy. No, the Sorry, one, go ahead. The one I saw, a guy gets out of his car and he goes to the person that's sitting in the road blocking traffic and he says, Sir, I'm on parole. If I don't make it to work oh. on time, they will send me to jail. I need you to move. I'm pleading with you to move from the road. Got it. What you're talking about, super important. That's great. But I need to be at work on time or they will come get me and take me to jail. I'm trying to do the right thing. And they wouldn't move. And he gradually started accelerating and getting more and more heated. At one point, he rips his shirt off. He's trying to physically move people out of the way. The police showed up and arrested the man trying to move the people that were blocking the road. How do you think that makes me feel? About like it made me feel. <laughs> I'm being cool. Yeah, like, I know. Look at, me, look at my body language. Yeah, you, you look really, very cool. Yeah. I'm being cool. Yeah. So I don't feel cool. The people that needed to be arrested are the ones blocking traffic, but the man that tried to solve the situation, he was the one that got hauled off to jail. Granted, he lost his temper, but... That tells me something's wrong. Something's wrong. We are, yeah, we're, we're just wrong right now. <laughs> Society is jacked up. What the fun thing about this story is I, I don't even have to tell you if the people that were protesting were on the left or the right because you don't know. And but, part of the problem is that it was only one of those two options. Yeah. That's it, part of what's wrong. Yeah. Here's the thing, dude. This fourth generational turning thing, I kind of buy it. I'm not sure it's always so neat and tidy. It looks really, really big. It looks much more complicated than the little quote that I started with. So yeah. I'm going to reserve judgment and say that because you and I have not read it, we cannot say that it is the same thing that we're talking about here, right? Yeah, I feel like I'm pretty familiar with the theory, uh -huh. but I have not read the book. I haven't heard the arguments. To me, I am pretty skeptical of any singular meta narrative that explains all sweeping human phenomenon. I just... Mm, I'm not that deterministic. And that's one of the big critiques of the book is that it's overly deterministic, overly behavioralist. It's just this simple. I think stuff's a little more complicated than that. I think this is a useful descriptor in broad general strokes for a phenomenon that can run itself two or three cycles, but maybe not forever. That said, you remember when we were talking about Top Gun Maverick and we were talking about Star Wars, I think back to back conversations, I... <laughs> took the risk because it offends everyone of pointing out what to me is a more accurate descriptor of what's been going on for the last 30, 40 years of our conversation in our country. And it's that we've been dominated by theocratic fundamentalism, first a Christian version, then a far leftist version. And both of them are incredibly dangerous and reactions against each other that will just keep going back and forth. And each time the pendulum violently swings to the other one. The stakes get ratcheted up and we're more likely to have something really, really bad happen on the other side. From the mid 2000s to the late 20 teens, I was even willing to use the word libertarian to describe what I thought, not the political party, but kind of a Western liberalism approach. And part of the reason that I was willing to use that term to describe myself during that time is not because, uh, as some would charge, I'm a Republican who likes weed. Uh, I'm not a Republican, and I don't like weed, <laughs> so I hate that. But I felt like, man, right now, here's a pathway forward. You have to stop the pendulum somewhere. You have to slow down the violence of these swings. You've got to find a way to differentiate between what things should be dictated to others by whoever has the momentum right now and what things just aren't touchable. You get to talk. 
You get to make contracts with people. Even if I don't like all your contracts, you get to, and we're going to honor your contracts. You got to give everybody the blessings of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Everybody. You got to invite everybody to the game. You can't good old boys club it and deal people out. There is a sane way forward for us to function together. And I had kind of hoped that maybe there would be some moment in between 2005 and I maybe started to lose faith in this in 2019, 2020, somewhere in there, that maybe there would be a way for a movement to occur where we would just grab the pendulum and be like, no, I understand that 10% of us on the far left and right are super angry and worked up and everything's apocalyptic, but no, you two are the problem. You are the problem with your fundamentalism and your inability to tolerate anyone who doesn't think like you. We got to stop that pendulum right there and we have to find some some new mechanism for how we think and talk and function peaceably with each other. We're not going back to this weird fundamentalism. We have to stop the cycle. And it didn't happen. The cycle accelerated. So my point in that is to say, look, I'm not even sure I necessarily, I, I think I have a little different view of the unfolding of history right now than maybe the Strauss Howe thing. But also I could be wrong because I'm super sensitive to fundamentalism because I was raised around it and because I'm in a lifelong process of rejecting my own moral superiority and fundamentalism. And so maybe I'm just going to see those patterns more readily than I see the patterns that Strauss Howe theory would observe. One way or another, stuff happens for a reason. Stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. All the things that are happening are somehow a reaction and they're somehow connected. And there are canaries in the coal mine. And one of those canaries is honestly the difference in the experience you get when you walk up and talk to someone who has a basic job at a basic place, maybe a first job, whereas 20 years ago, maybe they, they understood the point of the job and their first objective was do it and fulfill the purpose of the job. Whereas now, maybe even through prudent self-preservation, that doesn't seem to be as readily apparent. Even if I understand the calculation that that employee is running, there is a canary in the coal mine going on there. The fact that we cannot reopen the lobby of an Arby's is a canary in the coal mine. Right. Yeah. Experience that today. Matt, today's sponsor, one of my favorites. I'm excited to tell you about it. Well, I'm excited to hear. Audible. I actually knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Audible is a, a place where you can go get audiobooks and make your brain better. Yeah. And um, today I want to talk about the Plus Catalog. Okay. Open okay. up your your old Audible app right. there. Right, I got that opened. So the way I get to the Plus Catalog in mine is I'm going to go to Search. Okay, Search. And then uh, I'm going to go to the Plus Catalog. It says Audible Plus up there. I'm going to click on that. And then I can, these titles are included with membership. And so I have all these different things that I can click on here. And uh, I can I can get these for free, so I can listen to a hundred of these a month if I want to, because of my Audible subscription. That'd be so very impressive. That would be very impressive. Mm -hmm. I wonder if truckers listen to like a whole lot. I would if I was a trucker. I would like devour audiobooks. There was a guy, a certain guy, who a while back, in my circles, made some very public claims about like I I read easily a book a day. And everybody was like, eh. but if he was using Audible, maybe he was powering audiobooks like that. I, I don't know. I haven't done the math on it. I think it's possible. So if you were like listening at 5X, but the point is, get your phone. If you, if you would like to check out Audible, highly recommend it. Go to audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500. That gets you Audible free for 30 days. So, again, that's audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500. All these books, man, you have access to all of them. And uh, you can – look, there's – dude, there's many <laughs> – I almost read one of the titles I was looking at called Napoleon's Hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you actually did read it now that I think about it. Yeah, so I was like, oh, what is this? And so, yeah, totally. There's a book here called Napoleon's Hemorrhoids. Sign what? me up. And I've always others, wondered. It says Napoleon's hemorrhoids and other small events that change history. <laughs> okay, that's actually amazing. Look at this. Because this is the plus catalog, boom, added to my library. Success. Thank you. Your title is being delivered to your library. It may take a few minutes. 
refresh your library if you don't see it. Look right there in my library. What's the worst that can happen? Napoleon's hemorrhoids and other small events that, sh- wow. You get four or five chapters in, you're like, all right, I think I understand what the hemorrhoids did. I think I'm good here. <laughs> well, that's fine. Wow. Because it was right there in the plus catalog. Look at this. I'm just scrolling through here. Ender's Game Alive, the full cast audio play. Oh, really? Like the the cast, play? Reading, yeah, I think that's kind of a fun way to do it. That's in the plus catalog? Uh, oh, 1984. I like 1984. Well, I don't like it. Nobody likes 1984. But they li- it's important it's to listen to. It's important. It. Yeah, it is. That's some Sherlock Holmes stuff. The point here. is, Audible expands your life in ways you didn't even anticipate. I never thought when I woke up this morning, you know what I'm going to learn more about today? Napoleon's hemorrhoids. Napoleon's hemorrhoids. Absolutely. But now my life is more enriched. You so, know what's happening right now? <laughs> what? There's a whole bunch of people who, whenever somebody says hemorrhoids, they're like, oh, yeah, who are now finally Googling what hemorrhoids are. Oh, really? <laughs> you know what's happening <laughs> right now. I see you. You're right there hunched over your phone like a hobgoblin trying to make sure nobody on the train sees you. What are hemorrhoids? <laughs> <laughs> Don't Google that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Audible's a huge supporter of the podcast. We are grateful. They've been a longtime partner. If you would like to support the podcast and make yourself smarter, you can do that by going to audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500. Yeah, it's awesome. Check out the Plus catalog. They have tons of selections to choose from. I really think audiobooks are the way to ingest stuff into your brain. It's great. Here's a question. Yes, sir. I'm going to read the statement again. Mm-hmm. Hard times create strong men. Mm-hmm. Strong men create good times. Mm-hmm. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Are we the weak men? Calculating. Calculating. Buffering. Deciding. (laughs) I'm trying to decide how much I like my job. (laughs) Um, I like my job a lot. I'm still going to go with honest, man. Um, I believe in our generation. I think there's something to Gen X. You're a millennial, I guess. I'm the tail end of Gen X, I guess. I think that there is a bridge the gap generation that is about to move into leadership culturally that completely feels and gets the gripes of millennial Gen Z, whatever you want to call the upcoming generations, but also still are standard bearers of the West. It's fashionable to throw all of that out, but the West was on to something, man. Like the West ended slavery. It defeated its own tendency in that direction. The West liberated women, man. The West figured out that, hey, like at some point, you can't just ostracize everybody who does sex, attraction, and love differently than what is considered traditional. You you have to treat people well. That's all the West. That's all because of liberalism. That's all not liberalism like modern Barack Obama. I mean, like historical freedom and liberalism. It's a good tradition with flaws, but it's a dang good tradition that has lifted the world out of poverty. I feel like maybe the next generation of leaders will be like, ah, there's a lot of good stuff there. We wouldn't want to pitch. Also, that's not working as well as you would want it to for a whole lot of people in up and coming generations. Maybe we can make this time of hurt really, really short and get back to the good times or build a new version of good times. And that for me, I'm hopeful that whoever the next round of leaders are, I don't know if we get to be one of those at some point or how we play it, but I'm hopeful that the next round of leaders is empathetic to what's happening now, but also sees the value in really hard-earned lessons from the past that we've figured out. I think about this and kind of what I'm doing with these thoughts that have been swirling around in my head is I'm like doubling and tripling and quadrupling down on my children and I'm making them as strong and individualistic as possible. So I took these young men and I had them demolish. Oh, the wall smashers. The wall smashers. Okay. There were eight kids in How'd, there. How'd they do? They did well. There were a few of them that have social challenges. And I got them in one part of the room and they were working on that. And uh, what was great is some of the other kids came along like, hey, can I go in there and work with them? Yes, go work with them. And hmm. so they started working together and they all were teamwork. They understood the mission. <clears throat> they understood the mission. There are walls, make it so there aren't. And there was a tractor there and we had a tractor with a bucket on it. Mm-hmm. And when I got them up for the briefing, I was like, here's what we're going to do, men. And yeah, I was addressing them all as men. Here's what we're going to do, men. What I need is uh, I need you all 
to find a wall, that's your wall. You're taking that wall down. At some point today, every one of you is going to drive this tractor and you're going to take the scraps and you're, you know, everybody's going to fill this bucket up and you're going to put it in that dumpster over there. You have to do this. And uh, my son was the youngest person there. Mm -hmm. He knew how to do all these things already. And I pointed at him and I said, my son there, he's going to teach you how to drive the tractor. You're going to be careful because if you do it wrong, you're going to smash a hole in, in the outside here. Can't do that. So you have to be careful. And and they look at me like, you're going to let me drive. I'm driving that. Mm -hmm. And every one of them rose to the challenge. Every single one of them. They knew it was serious. They drove very slow, very careful. They accepted the challenge and they embraced it and they did great. It was awesome. And that just happened to be the group of young men that were in a class I work with at church, you know, just ninth, 10th graders. And so happened to be that. So I was like, you know, I'm encouraged by how they did. My daughter is incredible. Like she Your daughter's are, a beast. It's ridiculous. She's impressive. Your daughters are the same, but um, she already knows how to do all this. She's well beyond. You and I needed to go grab a trailer today to knock out a little bit of work, help somebody out with the thing. We went to do it, and <laughs> there's that same tractor was sitting in the way of the trailer. We needed to go and, and move a thing for somebody. And I was like, well, should I move the tractor? I'm like, I can move your tractor. But nope, I wasn't even out of my seat. I was still calculating, see a problem, solve a problem, what's my role? And there goes your kid skipping over there, and she hops right in and just absolutely handled that tractor without even hesitation. It was not interesting to her either. It was, was it? a no. She was didn't expect a pat on the back. She wasn't looking at you like, see what I did. It was see a problem, solve a problem. I have the means to do it. I'm doing it. It was awesome. So proud of them. So proud of them. Very, very proud. One of the kids that was there was a ten year old boy. He had never done anything like that before. And so I took a picture of him handling this crowbar, and he was doing such a great job. And he clearly, if you see the pictures, like man, this is a child that's not used to handling such large tools like this. This is a moment. Mm -hmm. So I tweeted something along the lines of, I had the opportunity to work with some young men today. We, uh, we learned how to use hammers and we, you know, I just said some good things about them and, yeah. and, uh, you were excited about it for what it's worth. Like, very excited. like I, I, I know this, I don't remember if you told me, but I mean, we talk a lot. So sometimes we forget what, he, what we tell each other. Yeah. But I did know you did this and you called me as it was going on. And you were, you were gushing about it, about pumped, other man. people's kids and what they were doing. So excited. Yeah. It was and, a win. And, and all, all the parents got it. They know what we were doing. And uh, so I tweeted this and the point was, I'm proud of these young people who are rising to the task. Yeah, good. What do you think the responses to that tweet was? Oh, I almost reverted to naive, <laughs> innocent me there for a minute that didn't even think about. You're like, and I tweeted it. And I was like, good. That's fun. I bet everybody. And then. You the way you asked that question, <sighs> yeah. Me who is disappointed and wounded by the state of the world is like, oh yeah, you put pearls in front of the trough. Oh yeah, turn and devour you. I was lectured. Oh, of course you were lectured. I'm just trying to think of which one it would have been. <laughs> um, you know, you know what? Just tell me what which lecture did you get this time? I was lectured uh, because you know it was something like. I, I think I remember it's like, well, I hope you're going to do the same thing with your daughter because, uh, oh. you know, and, and I was told, I like, didn't think about I that know one. when that time comes, you will. But like, I hope you're going to do the same thing with your daughter because these are boys. And <laughs> that was one thing to see that. The, the next thing was my wife saw it and she replied. She goes, oh. Yeah, she saw the tweet and she was like, whoa, they're implying that you don't teach your daughter how to do things. She's like, <laughs> yeah, she, so my wife saw that and she was like, oh my goodness, that your daughter doesn't know how to do things. It was incredible. Your daughter could command an army. She's in middle school. My, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter can do brake pads. She can weld. She can do brake drums. I was fishing today and your family was around for a minute. And then you guys were, were doing some stuff. We just had a little a little break. It was pleasant. We were out by a, a pond and I took a rod. I threw it out a couple times. Your daughter was like, nah, nah, that's not how you fish. 
She came. She over. said that to you? No, no, she didn't say oh. it. She would never be rude like that. Oh, I was about to but say. But I could just tell that she was like, nah, I, I know where this line needs to go. She came over, grabbed one, and just immediately threw it out in the muck, in the mud. Like, nah, I think this is where they'd be. She, I mean, just utter competence. Didn't need to impress me. Wasn't trying to show me she could fish. She was watching what I was doing, kind of looking where I was, and she's a little more familiar with the area and the wildlife here. And she's, she's trying like, to outfish you? I think she was. Yeah. Or she just likes fishing and knows how to do it so she wouldn't give it a second thought to just do a thing. Yeah. She just did a thing. Yeah. And she didn't need my approval. It was awesome. So, so very awesome. My point is that comment directed at you was it's comical. ignorant nonsense. Yeah, it is. And so- it wasn't the initial comment. It's like, oh, well, this is an ignorant person. They mm-hmm. clearly don't know me. They clearly don't know my children. Mm-hmm. And, and that's by design. And, and this is a public virtue signal. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, it's true. It wasn't even about you or yeah, her well-being. Yeah, it's more about the person than yeah, me. Yeah, sure. I know the play. And then um, and then I was like, oh, what do, what do I do here? Do I respond? And I've got, I've got five pictures right here in my phone in the last month of her literally tearing the brakes off this trailer <laughs> and fixing it. <laughs> oh, I could do this one where she's welding. I could do that one. Or I could do this one over here where she's doing this thing that I don't want to say on the internet. So did you answer the folly? No, I did not. I was silent. And I said, you know, it's okay. You're weak. You're a weak person. Did you hear that thunder roll right when you said it's okay? You're weak? I did. Because that that was rad. (laughs) (laughs) I did hear that. I said, you know, you're weak. You don't get it. It doesn't matter what I say. You're not going to understand. And I think that's okay. And so my role, I think at this point in time, is to continue to do what I know is right and to continue to teach my children when they're working and someone comes and orders something and they don't know what to do to quickly solve the problem by looking around, finding a manager, asking the question, don't care about how you look, just get the answer. Because you understand the mission is to give this this individual ice cream or to figure out, you know what? You just want this thing. Let's just get through these computer screens because the mission here is to give you whatever. My goal is to create leaders, leaders of men and women. And I want to make ferocious children that Mm -hmm. are not scared of anything, but at the same time are humble, gentle, gentle, strong, compassionate, empathetic, but I want to make ferocious children that are not scared of anything. And that's what I'm going for. You think that's why we're friends or do you think we're friends for a whole bunch of other reasons and that just happens to overlap with how we, what we're going for with the whole parent thing? Because I, I quickly resonated with your parenting same. when I was getting to know you. Yeah. Uh, first time we sat at a restaurant and the waiter, uh, your son in particular, impressed me. At the time, he was extremely young. Waiter came to the table, direct eye contact. This is what I would like to order, please. Thank you. When the waiter came back to the table, he was aware that the waiter was at the table and he was giving direct attention better than my children. And so I, I, I took notes. And so we've been working on that after seeing how your children handled themselves at the table. But do you remember that one time we ordered and we ordered and then we went around the table and every one of our children ordered as if they were an adult and they were all children. Yes, I do. Wasn't that fun? Also, it's every time. I've never seen your kids do anything other than that. Yours too. So very proud of them. We are given the opportunity, I believe by God, to invest in these people's lives for a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's an honor to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that my parents did the same for me. And I'm glad that my dad let me make mistakes, mm-hmm. made sure I learned the lesson, and moved forward. And those little mistakes that he let me learn taught me more than the mistake I was making in the moment. Mm-hmm. I just want to tell you all that. I don't know if this is what I'm thinking. Well, I had an aha there as you're going along. So I've, I've been using the phrase, my metric for what I view as this swing between radical fundamentalisms that most people reject but they're so polar that you've like every time one wins, you kind of get roped into its orbit and you have to say and act like you think certain things that are absurd and that you don't actually believe at all. 
until it gradually becomes unfashionable. Then you can think the things you think. Then you got to play along with something else you think is stupid that's completely different. The majority of people are not into this crap, but it's crippling. It has a weakifying effect. It, it debilitates you. It limits your options. You get in the habit of lying, maybe not overtly, but lying is a weak thing to do. What do you mean in the habit of lying? I mean, you get in the habit of playing along and pretending to think things you don't think. You mean in society, this is what's happening right yes. now? Yes. There's something real wrong with being cruel and unkind to people. And all of this stuff, it just goes together. What's more cruel than making people lie to pretend like they think your thing? It's exhausting. But in all of that, I've kind of had this metric like, all right, the solution, the answer to your question, how do we quickly get through the bad times that we've made? We're up. We're due. It's our turn to have bad times. I get it. Well, part of my answer has been see a problem, diagnose it, solve the problem, take action. But I like the way you just use the word opportunity. See a problem is negative. That's reactionary. It's on defense against the destructive forces in the world, forces that come from all ends of the political spectrum. I like the word opportunity. Now, it's not enough to just train my kids. And I don't think I'm, I'm just training them this way, but it's not enough to just train my kids to say, see a problem, solve a problem. Well, then what do you do? You go around all the time looking for problems so you can do the one thing you're good at, identifying bad things and solving it. Well, I want you to be good at that. But what comes along more often than problems is opportunities. Opportunities to make a waiter who's serving a table full of kids feel respected, appreciated, and make their job easy at what should be a difficult table. It's just basic human courtesy and connection. Every time you interact with somebody, that's an opportunity to improve the world by improving this person's life. Every time you do business, every time you drive, it's an opportunity. Any kind of interaction, the opportunities are everywhere. I think the way through the ick time, which like it's fun that we're still imagining we're not going to do it, Oh, we're going to do it. The question is just how long are we going to do it before we get what we need to get out of it and start finding solutions? There are problems that will need to be solved. There are opportunities that need to be seized. What it looks like to be not weak, to be a person of strength during hard times or any time, I think is to be a person who sees a problem and has the, the courage to act, to take the risk, to do something that is right and noble themselves, not screech for someone else to do it on your behalf. I think the person who is strong in those situations is also the person who is craftily and proactively on the lookout for redemptive things they might contribute to the situation. How might I make this better? Not screech for someone else to make it better on my behalf. How might I make it better? And I think that's what strength looks like. And I think we will probably suffer for a time until Earth teaches us those things. And I am already... hmm. I've said a lot of things that make me uncomfortable to say into a mic in this conversation. Here's another. Earth is teaching me those things. God, reality, is teaching me those things that I have not been. I have contributed to the problem by turning my nose up at opportunities to be redemptive. I've been a part of the problem by seeing problems and not making it my problem and doing it myself to make things better and being unwilling to take certain risks for the benefit of others in either direction. And so this isn't just about other people to me. I am feeling the strain of what, of this turning right now. And I hope I learn. I hope I pass it along to the people I influence. I appreciate all that. Thank you for saying that. That was a way of turning that back to ourselves. I would like to do something very strange okay, that we don't normally do. All right. So um, I would like to speak directly to the third chair. Oh. Yeah, weird. I would like to say this. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, whatever your position in society is, be strong. Strength is not angry and yelling strength can also be meekness where you're very strong and you know what's going on and you know meekness is the ability to have strength but also use it in certain situations how would you just describe meekness matt restrained strength strength yeah. judiciously employed yeah so strength is not yelling louder than other people 
I would just encourage you wherever you are, if you're feeling helpless in whatever situation, if, if other people are thinking things you're not and, and you feel helpless or whatever, be strong. Do what you can in the situation that you're in. If you have children, make them ferocious, <laughs> make them like courageous, like make them that. strong um, and empower them to do what is right and also empower them to have empathy and respect towards others and, and love, love others. Weakness is seeing a problem and doing nothing except maybe screeching for someone to do something while you film it. Weakness is not even recognizing opportunities that are right in front of our faces, but even weaker is to see it and do nothing. An opportunity to serve, an opportunity to make something better, an opportunity to proactively, creatively redeem something. That's weakness. Strength in these times mean that you think about what role you can play. How can you contribute? If there's a problem, how can you serve? How can you help? What can you do? to do something to bring about redemption or, or to, to be helpful to your fellow person. Strength in these times, in these difficult times that are here and I think are coming, means look for creative, proactive opportunities to make things better and take steps in ways that are humble and serving of others and redemptive. It's think, strategize something that is redemptive and good and do. And what do you mean by redemptive? I mean stuff that makes stuff better and particularly, I'm taking a page out of the playbook of someone I deeply respect. It doesn't just mean serving people like us. It means serving people who theoretically are our enemies. Hey, if you want to get past the bad times fast, that's a great way to do it. Be empathetic, compassionate, and adopt a heart of service toward people who on paper you theoretically are not supposed to like very much. One thing I'm going to do in all this mm -hmm is I'm going to open my mind to the possibility that I might be the weak one. <laughs> and so what I'm doing or how I'm acting might not be correct. And so I'm just going to try to remain intellectually honest and imagine like, okay, am I doing what's right in this case? Am I, is there a blind spot that I don't see? Is my emotional reaction to this tweet, this person, uh, not as loving as it should be? I'm going to think about these things. I've been trying to figure out how to address some of this stuff in a way that actually gets through the armor of the screeching, as you call it. Like, how do I actually connect with the heart of the person that I'm disagreeing with in a way that will actually hit home and resonate in a positive way? I'm thinking about that. For the time being, I'm going to teach young boys and young girls how to swing hammers and how to drill holes in rods of steel, and how yeah, to weld. I think that's pretty good. And how to serve others. That's what I'm going to do. 